Night for dinner. Okay, that <laughs> quite well. Um, now this is a, um, a group that uh, obviously everybody in here, if you were to ask uh, somebody, um, everyone who uh, wants to be a millionaire, please raise your hand. Um, obviously everybody would raise your hand. Um, and um, entrepreneurship uh, is obviously something that's taken hold here. I think this is an amazing society. I think this is a wonderful thing. Um, I wish it existed when I, when I uh, was getting started. Because actually, I'm sort of the accidental entrepreneur. Um, I didn't get into this thinking I'd start a company, thinking I'd get into biotechnology. <coughs> um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd sort of tell you my own story, how I got involved in this uh, business. Um, and I actually never thought you could make this kind of money doing it. Um, I'm a cardiologist. I'm trained as a cardiologist. Um, I'm one of these people who are known as mud fuds that have an MD and a PhD. And um, my goal was always to do science in an academic institution. And I uh, currently sort of have a dream job uh, back at uh, my alma mater at Harvard and Mass General, where I direct a large center there. Um, but um, in the early days of academic medicine, uh, people didn't really start companies. People didn't, it actually was frowned upon. It was viewed as being, why are you doing that? That's kind of dirty, you know, that's kind of going over to the dark side. And of course now the whole thing is flipped around. We have deans and presidents trying to encourage you to do uh, entrepreneurial activities, file intellectual property, uh, do deals with companies and everything. So it's actually kind of flipped over, if you will. And so, um, I guess uh, the, for you, um, what I'd like to do is sort of tell you about my own path, um, and then from that, um, lessons learned that could be um, general for people who are interested in entrepreneurship. And for those of you, any of you who are scientists, uh, or physicians, or aspiring physicians or scientists, or interested in biotechnology, I'll, I'll talk about more specific things and be happy to take questions. Obviously, in a short period of time, it would be very difficult to uh, convey um, 20 years of experience in this business. Um, but what I can tell you is um, when they talk about venture, um, it really is adventure. It's not just adventure. <laughs> and like with any adventure, it can be up, down, and sideways. Um, it's not a straight line. And you've got to hold on tight. And um, two of the most important words in entrepreneurship, I think, is no fear. Okay. And that's actually true for almost everything in science. So I'm going to use the board here sort of as an example. So um, one thing about uh, biotechnology, and I'll sort of use this my own uh, experience as a guy. It's not um, it's not that easy to do. Okay, it's quite different from other uh, starting other businesses. And one of the reasons is you've got to start with intellectual property. So if you, uh, you, you may be aware you can start businesses on the web, jewelry design, all these other things. You don't need a lawyer, you don't need patents, you don't need intellectual property. Um, intellectual property is at the core of biotechnology. The most important two letters in biotechnology are IP. Okay, so let's put that up here. Now, um, IP, intellectual property, of course, is something that's patentable, and there are discoveries made in science every day. Okay. Um, so how do you know whether, you know, you pick up the uh, journal, there are major discoveries every week. A new gene is discovered for this, for that, et cetera. How do you know whether this IP is worth starting a company on? And so that's one of the questions. Um, and the next question is, where does IP come from? Well, it's intellectual property. And I think the first most important word in that is intellectual. And because intellectual means people. The three most important, uh, um, I think, criteria or things to consider in a biotechnology company are people, people, people. I'll come back to that. And that starts with the individual starting the company and the group that you have around it. So one of the things I think here are inventors. You need to have inventors. The inventors do this. Now, where are these inventors located? The inventors, oftentimes, it's not in your garage, you know, the Hewlett Packard thing, and that's great. Sometimes it happens in our business, very unusual. Usually the inventor, and there, there are exceptions, but often the in inventors are in academia. They're in places like this, Caltech. In fact, uh, one of the biotechnology companies that was uh, quite successful had founders from Caltech, Mel Simon, 
um, who now has probably started several companies. There, um, the, the company that uh, he was involved in, um, in San Diego, eventually got taken over by Pfizer, Agron, and they're the ones that made the first uh, anti-HIV uh, drug, protease inhibitors, you may, you may have heard of those. They, they made the prototype of that, was taken over by Pfizer, and um, so this is one of the things here that, that starts in academia. Now academia, um, oftentimes, uh, obviously is, is very uh, sort of uh, fragmented. I would say you have the kind of research, research institute, And that would be like Caltech, and then you have the hospital. And it, there's a, there are other variations of these. But oftentimes things start here. Inventors pop out here. They create IP. And then this IP has to be matured. Okay. And this is sort of like I would call, they call this Death Valley here. And that is because you've got this. But before this, this has to mature to several stages before it can get to a point where um, the IP is matured. And at this time, you can get the next important step here, which is initial investors. Then this goes to the next step, because uh, then you have what would be called NUCO. And then the NUCO progresses where it goes through Series A, Series B, Series C. And then somewhere along here, you get partnerships. And of course, at each one of these stages, <coughs> needless to say, there's money here, there's money here, there's money here, there's money here, 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 and of course here. And then eventually you get product. Now, you can see that if, let's just take my daughter's uh, business, that uh, you start out here, you're in your norm, and you say, you know what, I think I'm going to make jewelry, okay? I think I'm going to put it on the net. I think I'm going to go to eBay. I think I'm going to make money doing this. I'm going to design stuff, go to China, travel around the world, get ideas, put the corporate in my design. You know what? You go right from here, you go all the way down to here. Okay, you have to <laughs> Okay, so you say, because if you look at this, what the, the challenge here is every one of these stages, you've got to raise money. Every single one. And as I said, I started out here, okay? <laughs> because I had an MD, I had this. I had a PhD, I had this. I had no idea of any of this. Zero. This is what I learned over the last 20 years accidentally. And, um, I'm the accidental inventor. I'm you know, the accidental tourist. I'm the accidental entrepreneur. I didn't, I didn't really think I would be doing this. Um, I did this because I wanted to advance human health and you know try to see if science could improve uh, patient care and um, as a cardiologist. And um, the way I got involved in this is that uh, even before I was an inventor, having these two things as a physician and a scientist was attractive to a company at that time called Genentech. This was in uh, 1990. And um, believe it or not, Genentech at that stage was in Quonset huts, um, and the company was in danger of actually going bankrupt. Um, it had uh, one product, tissue plasma engine activator, clot buster, uh, but there was a competitive product, streptokinase, and the patent was being challenged, and the stock was worth about $22 straight up. <coughs> that uh, one share of that stock now would probably, for $22, would probably be worth um, somewhere between um, three dollars and $5,000, $22 stock. So, uh, and um, so anyway, this is uh, was the first uh, contact I had, and I was called to quit here and join here. Okay, and so what I did was is I decided I didn't want to quit because um, I actually like being in academia, um, and uh, actually turned down their offer, which, um, as I said, if you can imagine what those shares would have been worth.